Well, thanks for waiting. Um, now we want to talk about assessing financial stability and monetary policy in the transition. So to conclude uh, this discussion, we're joined by Sir Paul Tucker to discuss how we should assess both of those things in the transition to a lower carbon economy. Sir Paul is former deputy governor of the Bank of England for financial stability. He's a fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School and the author of Unelected Power, The Quest for Legitimacy in Central Banking and the Regulatory State. And we are privileged to have his insights. Paul, welcome. And thanks for joining us today. Well, thank you very much for having me. I'm looking forward to this. So first, to start with objectives and maybe state the obvious, monetary policy aims at keeping inflation low and stable, and financial stability policy aims at making the financial system resilient to shocks. I think we agree on that, but we're now experiencing globally high inflation. Where did central banks miss on that objective? They were complacent. And I think the source of the complacency isn't quite clear yet. It's partly, I think, that people started to take it for granted that medium to long-term inflation expectations were somehow anchored to the target, which in modeling terms means that almost whatever happens, inflation, like out of the forces of gravity, returns to your target, and you can fix other things in the meantime. I, I'm in Harvard at the moment, as you know, Dick, and I've had conversations with all sorts of people in different parts of the US about this. And a thing that keeps on coming up is, oh, the staff's model um, assumes anchored inflation expectations. And the policy response to that should be, so what? I mean, that's just something you put in the model, but it's the, the, the true anchor is the policymakers. And the policymakers need to exercise judgment. And one of the key judgments they need to make in any period of monetary policy is, is the analysis coming up from the staff, is it plausible, is it right, broadly right, is it wrong? Can it, can it given the unusual things that are going on um, with the, the, the job of policymakers is to exercise judgment. There was a thing in the FT this morning about the ECB, and apparently the ECB has issued a statement saying they're going to update the models after their um, inflation overshoot. And that, that, sounds, that sounds like a kind of sensible exercise. I can imagine commissioning that. But we need to hear something from the policymakers about their judgment. Um, um, mistakes, as it turns out. I mean, if we're just relying on the staff models, can the staff lead the press conference for the Fed and, um, um, and the ECB and others, please? And if, it's, if, it's, if the policymakers really are policymakers, then, as, as I, they are, of course, um, then they can't just hide behind the staff models. In the old days, in the Bank of England, the Bank of England I was part of, was, well, we need all these models, but of course they're all wrong. And then sometimes they're going to be badly wrong. And sometimes we'll need to substitute our judgment. And it was always the debate with the staff whenever anything happened um, was where could we be making a mistake? And I, I think complacency is set in. We'll have to see whether the Fed's mistakes of 2001 are replicated this year. Some people think they will be. I don't want to offer a view on that. But if they are, they're in trouble. And there's a silver lining to that that we'll come to later. But I also think that they made mistakes in 2020. I think it was great that they intervened to stabilize government bond markets and ensure cash got to the government so that government could get cash to households and businesses being crushed by the pandemic. But once the immediate um, market, once markets stabilized, they should have taken some of that back. They didn't make a, they didn't make a case in 2020 for sustaining um, the extraordinary QE, which shouldn't have been described as QE. It should have been described as a market maker of last resort. So my own view, which is different from others, is that they made mistakes in 2020 and then they compounded them in 2021. And part of this is to do with 
somehow not understanding that, which I find difficult to believe, so it probably isn't true, um, that it all worked by magic. That the credibility of Volcker and Greenspan and Bernanke and Yellen and Powell was somehow inscribed in the, the runes of the universe. That is not true. These, the reason we don't have a rules, a completely rules-based policy is because we need humans to maintain the outcome. And even in the realm of financial stability, the reform program following the financial crisis left much undone, especially in non-bank financial intermediation and systemically relevant markets. So how should central banks and we address those gaps and what are the risks in not doing so? Um, well, the risk of not doing so have another financial crisis of some kind. We've seen what that does. I mean, it's, it hurts people. It hurts the social fabric, the cultural fabric, the political fabric, even the constitutional fabric. Financial crises, big financial crises, have always been terrible things. We've known that for a long time. Um, the biggest omission is, is what you call non-bank finance, and I call shadow banking. Not, not all non-bank finance is shadow banking, but it's when the, the real concern is when the fragilities um, inherent in banking are replicated in um, intermediaries whose legal form is not that of a bank, and therefore they don't have access to the lender of last resort ex ante, and they're not constrained in any way. And one of the things that happened in March 2020, April 2020, both sides of the Atlantic, both major financial centers, is among many other things, um, the money funds got bailed out um, yet again. And it, it has been somewhat surprising to me that this hasn't caused a great outcry and um, calls for reform. And it turns out that there has to be a mess for anyone to care. And how grim is that? And I, I think the only, we haven't yet had our Vulcan moment in financial stability. A central bank leader who comes along and is prepared to be unpopular to make the world a better place for ordinary people. And you know, whether it's lobbying or flawed analysis or in the States quite reasonably, people, could, people in effect could say, well, we couldn't get there. This would require legislation we can't get the legislation through. Well, they could say how dire they think it is that there are these fragilities outside. They could say something about what their approach to lender of last resort policy would be. They could air ideas about um, rescues and how to avoid rescues. And, and, they, and they could identify the lobbying that stands in the way. And by the way, and I, I, I think this is the biggest thing of all, I mean, Another financial crisis will be terrible for the US position of the US in the world, and actually therefore terrible for the Western world. The West cannot afford at this stage in history, by which I mean the next 25, 30 years, to be at the epicenter of another great financial crisis. And yet the job was not finished. And big picture, there's no excuse. So this is all rather bleak, actually. I'm sorry for that. These are people I admire a lot. No, we're trying to get people's attention here. So let's turn, let's uh, talk to a very important factor, which is one you've written eloquently about. And that is governance for central banks in particular and government in general, and how those objectives should be set by elected representatives and not mm. by elect, unelected technocrats. So how does governance measure up and have central banks taken on too many tasks reducing their capacity to achieve their primary goals? So I think the, the, the answer to the last question is simply yes. Look, politicians have incentives, elected politicians have incentives to sit on their hands and um, wait for central banks to try to do more. And this is a real problem for central banks. And I, I can't pretend that I've got an answer to it, but that's typically a harder problem with macroeconomic policy. I think when it comes to great social issues like climate change, which is an existential issue for goodness sake, and in inequality, I think there's another um, problem, which is that I, th there's nothing special about the men and women that head up central banks. I mean, I could say that for certainty about myself. Um, but what matters is that just men and women, 
often ambitious, and it's important that their, the returns to them personally, their professional prestige, and their, what public esteem there is, depends upon them um, achieving quite a narrow mandate, achieving price stability, achieving banking system stability. And I think we've got to a position, frankly, where I don't mean any this in any ad hominem or ad feminem um, sense, but I can imagine cases where central banks could really mess up on inflation, and yet the office holders still be held in high esteem for the contributions they've tried to make to social justice and climate change. And, and I think that's a real problem. I mean, I think the fact that they can do so many things because they have a balance sheet, that's just saying they're an alternative fiscal authority. And I, I think there's a double thing here. Normatively, we elect our fiscal authority. We elect people um, to make these distributional and other great choices. So that's one massive argument. That's what my book is about, really. But the other thing is that the only people that are going to preserve finance price stability are the people in the central bank. And we really need their, their ambitions, if you like, their frailties as humans, their aspirations to be absolutely dependent upon them delivering financial stability. So when I, this links to what I was saying about complacency um, earlier. You're not complacent if you think that everything in your career or what happens after your career, how you're remembered, will, be, will depend upon whether or not you maintained um, low and stable inflation and maintained a stable banking industry. And somehow central bankers have to kind of fend off these other um, functions. And I also think that civil society um, needs to help protect them actually, because it's protecting ourselves and put more pressure on government. And the answer can legitimately come back, well, who is to save um, the world, if you like, and who is to address inequality if governments won't do it and central banks could? And then I think I would say, because I understand that argument, for goodness sake, it's a massive one. Then I think I would say, you're not going to get much progress with inequality or even with climate change in a world of high and, and volatile inflation. And Americans are already seeing what high and volatile, high-ish, not even very high yet, high-ish and volatile inflation is doing to the body politic um, in, in the US. And I can think of certain regional bank presidents who a year ago were espousing certain causes that I think are tremendous and sounded as though they were kind of running for office for the House of Representatives or Congress. And um, the party they clearly support, um, um, is unlikely to win, to win the midterm elections and possibly the next um, presidential election um, because of the cost of living crisis, which the Federal Reserve has exacerbated. So I've got, there's a lot wrapped up there, which is normatively and people being self-restrained when they're in office. This is, it's a great privilege to be a senior central banker, but it means you can't go around pontificating about lots of other things. And I've thought that frankly, since Janet gave that marvelous speech in Boston when she first became Chair of the Fed on inequality. Yeah, and uh, one policymaker, uh, the the president of the Chicago Fed, has referred to the commitment to price stability as Odyssean for exactly that reason: tie yourself to the mast and ignore the siren song of other uh, other goals that might distract you. So let's turn to climate-related risks. The yes. transition monetary policy and financial stability. Do you agree that central banks should only address the consequences of climate related shocks rather than the causes? It sounds like you do. And what are the nuances in that broad assertion? So I think there is a massive nuance. So as you frame the question, I think the answer is yes, of their own volition, exercising their own discretion, they should, they will need to, to address um, various shocks that, that arise from climate change. And those shocks will be in many different shapes and forms and not always the way that perhaps people expect. But I mean, it's perfectly proper in a democratic society and a, under a constitutional democracy for Congress or, or the president of our Congress to say, but in various of your facilities, um, you are constrained from doing X, you are constrained to do X, for example, um, 
don't lend to polluting industries or whatever. I think if someone put, I think if Congress put the Federal Reserve under that kind of constraint, that's fine. My my um, concern would be the Federal Reserve people sitting around, or the Bank of England people, the ECB people, thinking around what can we fix today. And behind this is a point in economics, which is not only does um, the central bank, because of its balance sheet, have the capacity um, to be a substitute fiscal authority, because of its um, lending powers and because of its regulatory powers, it has um, the potential to be to set Pigouvian taxes for all sorts of social ills. And I, I think we call that government. And in my country, many centuries ago, the barons fought the king to get some representative assembly to decide those things. And maybe they'll be done less well sometimes for that, purpose, for that reason. But no one should think that my tribe of unelected officials will consistently deliver what the public want. I and mean, if they're responsible for climate change and they do too little, um, they're going to get attacked. And actually, eventually, central bankers will find themselves saying, well, we're not qualified to make these judgments. We actually have these judgments of how much and the striking the balance have to be by a, made by elected people. And so I, I'm absolutely not at all against Congress, Parliament, European Parliament, um, constraining central banks in various ways. I do, think, I do think, in terms of the argument of financial stability, there's a challenge. People say things like, we'll come on to this probably, um, um, climate change is bad for financial stability, therefore central banks ought to be in the business of helping to prevent climate change. And it's certainly true that climate change could be bad for financial stability. Wars are bad for financial stability too. And civil wars are bad for financial stability. And as you all know, Dick, this is a point that I've been making for two to three years. So nothing to do with this ghastly, ghastly tragic war um, yep. that is underway. But so should central banks be rationing the supply of credit to arms manufacturers? Um, and as soon as you frame it like that, you think, oh my God, that feels above central bankers' pay grade. And you bet it is. Yeah. Well, we'll get to that in a moment. But we've heard earlier today that we faced a world of serial supply shocks, including from climate change and the transition, and that they will be inflationary. And those may complicate achieving price stability. So how should central banks respond to those shocks? Well, and generally, there's no, there's no kind of very granular answer at a high level by maintaining the anchor, by maintaining expectations that um, inflation over the medium to long run will be in line with 2% or whatever the target um, is. I think the Federal Reserve should get back to a straightforward inflation target. I think its review ended in a mess and was conducted in a rather silly way. Um, are they now going to kind of undershoot for years because they've overshot for years? I mean, this isn't a, this isn't a complicated thought. Um, but the, the answer to your question is by maintaining anchored inflation expectations, and then subject to doing that, achieving that, which is an ongoing judgment, requiring ongoing vigilance, kind of help smooth um, the adjustment of the economy to all of those supply shocks, which by the way, won't all be, they won't all be inflationary. Some of them um, could be disinflationary, whether demographically or, or, or whatever. Um, so yes, they have a role um, to play, but it's all about smoothing what people call the business cycle. It's not really a cycle. Um, subject to having maintained anchored um, inflation expectations. Because if your anchor goes, then you end up chasing after that and having to generate recessions. And imagine having to generate a recession um, j just when there's a load of cost shocks because you've taken your eye off the ball, which I'm not predicting that, but some people are. Yeah. Um, and so on financial stability, uh, as you say, the argument that climate uh, risks are, are financial stability risks leads people to get central banks to focus on climate risks and not their causes. But climate related shocks could impair the functioning of the financial system or, or parts of it. And so how should central banks assess financial system resilience in that context? And what should they do about it? 
Well, the first, the big question is, given their view, whatever their view is of the potential shocks, does the banking system need more capital? It's extremely unlikely to need less capital. Um, does it need more capital to navigate um, the potential disturbances that lie ahead because of climate and, and other things? When one gets more granular than that, um, and th this dovetails with something I was saying earlier, it's, it's typically, perhaps typically is too strong. It seems frequently to be thought that um, the problems for financial stability will come from businesses that are polluting in some way, but it needn't be the case. Imagine a set of businesses that are completely green. I mean, that would satisfy um, the most assiduous environmental concerned citizen and campaigner that they are a green um, business, um, but they happen to be in an area, then they borrow a lot of money, they're big businesses. Um, but they happen to be in an area that is gonna be hugely adversely affected by climate change. So much so that these businesses under certain states of the world um, are gonna be bankrupt and they're gonna default on loans. And, you know, maybe, and if those loans are big, that could impair the banking system. Well, that's a world where you would want higher capital, higher risk weights to be held against green businesses because they're in potentially afflicted areas. When one thinks about climate change through the lens of financial stability, it's not a matter of good guys and bad guys in sense, the sense of um, polluting and non-polluting businesses, uh, which is the ex ante issue, and which is a big issue. And for, personally, I favor a carbon tax and have for many, many years. Um, financial stability, it's who's going to be adversely affected by climate change. And if they default, how big a ripple is that going to cause through the financial um, system? And Central banks are going to need to do that, and it's not going to be very happy, and it's not going to be very popular, because the people that they, by applying higher risk weights, requiring more capital to be held against, the cost of credit will go up, sometimes for brown businesses, so that will double up as a Peruvian tax, as it were, incidentally, but sometimes for green businesses too. And, and I, I'm, I'm not the only person to say that. I've been saying that for some years. And, and if I were the central bankers, I think I would um, be wanting to get that message across because if you're going to do unpopular things down the road, it's best not to do them by surprise, but to explain why you might need to do them. Yeah. Well, Paul, um, I think you've been very clear uh, and I apologize for the technical difficulties. Is there anything you'd like to conclude with for this session? I would like to say that this, that nearly all the good things in, in, in life um, require, depend upon some order and stability. I mean, that's what the dread walls are, the, 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 the extremity of disorder in a way. Severe climate change um, may, may come along and be that as well. Um, but actually, a disorderly financial system, very high and um, volatile inflation or, or deflation, um, harms everything else, harms the pursuit of justice, harms the pursuit of the good and the right. And these central banks exist just to provide a stable monetary system. And we need to let them stick to that. And we mustn't take it for granted. And they mustn't take it for granted. There is no gravitational pull. If there are forces of gravity, it is them. And, um, and they need, their reputation and standing in the community needs to be harnessed to that. And I desperately want them to succeed, not because I care about central banks, but because I think the welfare of the public depends um, on that. Thanks very much, Paul. We really appreciate you joining us today.